came down to a pair of game threes, but in the end, Melbourne and Tasmania advanced. We'll break down how it all happened on the jump, presented by Hungry Jacks. The burgers are better at Hungry Jacks. Kane Pittman and Andrew Gaze with you over the next 30 minutes. We're also going to hear from rising Aussie guard Tyrese Proctor. Will he enter the NBA draft? But first, let's get into tonight's opening tip. Melbourne and Tasmania are set for a five-game series with the title on the line. But first, let's rewind 24 hours and revisit the drama of Wednesday night. A spot in the championship series will be decided tonight. And I think that that knocked his confidence around a little bit, but this has been a very high quality finish. Come closer. Get in a man's face like Atley. Shay Hilly wide open. Nine point advantage to Melbourne. Make that 11. Running laps all around. Illy, big bucket. Melbourne United qualified for the championship series. Doyle with a beautiful move inside. And Milton Doyle goes straight back where he left off. Milton Doyle's got 21. Doyle forcing his way inside again. Milton Doyle. Stop. McDonald, Doyle from the corner. Another brush stroke in a masterpiece from Milton Doyle. An island defended. Love builds people back in Tasmania. This team loves you. We're coming back home. If you are not fired up listening to Scotty Roth, then I'm just not sure what is wrong with you. But the Jack Jumpers will have to get the job done on the road again. Game one slated for Sunday afternoon, 4 p.m. Eastern Daylight at John Kane Arena before both teams uh, take a bit of a deep breath. They're not playing again until Friday night, but Tasmania and Melbourne, two of the teams that have been, certainly from Melbourne's perspective, dominant throughout the regular season. Andrew Gaze is here to discuss what we saw last night, though. Uh, let's start with Tassie and this team's ability to just consistently get the job done, Gaze. We heard from Scotty Roth. This is a remarkable start to this three-year franchise. It has been, isn't it? Uh, all the way through to the, the playoffs and uh, now their second grand final appearance. It has been an extraordinary story. And Scott Roth, you could see the, and hear the emotion at the end of that uh, series win. It was just uh, heartwarming to see a coach so invested in his team. And I think there's also a, a bit of a sign of relief that they're able to get through and, and, and get the win. And they did it in, on the back of, of Milton Doyle. He's been fantastic his entire time here in Australia with the Jack Jumpers. The 24 points, he was consistent throughout the series. Albeit in that game one, uh, they didn't shoot the ball uh, all that well. But the, defensively, they were able to make life very, very difficult for the Perth Wildcats. They only had 13 uh, three-point field goal attempts, three of 13. And that's been one of the takeouts of that game is the way in which they ran the Perth Wildcats off the three-point line and took the ball out of uh, Bryce Cotton's hand. And uh, they were great on the offensive end, getting 100 points. But the way in which they really stymied the offense of the Perth Wildcats was the standout. Yeah, we discussed the impact Bryce Cotton was going to have in this series. Four total points in the fourth quarter of Game 2 and Game 3 combined was not going to be enough for the Wildcats. I think Sean McDonald did an excellent job there. Uh, let me ask you about Jack McVeigh. We've spoken about the rise of this guy over the last few seasons. But I would even say in the last two months, he's gone to full-blown superstar mode with some of the performances last night, 27 <laughs> points, four or five from three. He's gone to another level again, yeah. Gazy. Yeah, he's gone bunter throughout the playoffs. <laughs> it's been uh, fun to watch. He's a fun guy to watch because the way in which he plays with a smile on his face. He's that energy guy. He's that motivating force that each team needs. And you saw it in one of the timeouts during the game. He, I don't know exactly what he was saying, but he was expressing himself and uh, demanding uh, of, of his teammates. And this right here, the ability to knock down the, the, the three ball, he's always had, but he doesn't really take too many bad three-point field goal attempts. He can get his shot off uh, quickly. Extremely crafty around the basket. He takes some of those Dirk Nowitzki type one leg floaters and makes them look easy. But he is, uh, as I've been saying throughout the entire season, he is the captain of my all body language team as well by the way in which he projects himself uh, when he plays. It's a, it's a good example for the youngsters out there as far as 
enjoying the game, enjoying the experience. And that helps in your performance, I believe, anyway. Yeah, and it was interesting through this series, perhaps Jordan Crawford still the upside for this team from an offensive perspective as well. Will Magne was unbelievable. We've spoken about him a lot. Now, you were at the Melbourne and Illawarra series, so you had a courtside seat uh, to this one. What, what did you take away from Game 3? Because it certainly felt like Melbourne were just, just sharpened a little bit entering the first quarter of this one at JCA. Great resilience by Melbourne United. Uh, they were tested in this series. Two overtime games, and it was a, a nervous game for Melbourne United, but they came out and they stamped their authority early on in what they were going to do on the defensive end. And I think it was just a war of attrition. They just wore down the Illawarra Hawks, and in particular, Gary Clark, who's been a, a sensation. He only had the 14 points in the game and for a team that was averaging almost 110 points throughout the, 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 the series to come out and to to hold them into the 90s uh, albeit the 90s is still pretty high when you're playing against uh, Melbourne United it was a fantastic defensive performance and once again Melbourne United spread the load they had six players in double figures, led by Shay Illy, who mm. came in and knocked down a couple of threes. And I think a lot of that was strategically. You've got to pick your poison when you're playing against Melbourne United because they've got so many different scoring options. And they let uh, Shay Illy off the hook and, uh, and conceded him a couple of shots. And he was good enough to, to make them pay. Uh, speaking of one of the players that reached double digits, this series got a little grimy at times. Two overtime games, we know. But uh, Della Vadova's offensive influence. He hit a bunch of threes in game one, but I thought after that, it was his work inside the perimeter. Uh, what did you see courtside? Because I thought that he was just getting a shoulder into the defender and scoring any way uh, he could. Well, if you wanted an MVP for this series, my vote goes to Matthew Delavadova. Uh, in that game one, he had that offensive explosion. When it all looked lost, 16 points down, and it was his offense that was uh, keeping the scoreboard ticking over and ultimately got them a, a, a gutsy, hard-fought win. But his determination at both ends of the floor, the way in which he was demanding excellence out of his, uh, his teammates, and just the, the ferocious nature of the way he goes about it, uh, on, whether it's on the boards, the way he can, can create off the dribble. Now, I think that when, when I look back on it, the Illawarra Hawks, if they had their time again, they would have done a better, tried to have done a better job of keeping him out of the paint. Now, that's not easy, but he got onto his right hand a lot, particularly in game two and again last night. And his ability to finish around the rim, the floaters, on any time when he got into the paint, they, they created a crowd and, and provided some help. He's so good at either throwing over the top of the alley-oop or finding a hole where others can't find a hole to be able to thread the needle to a teammate. He was sensational, and uh, they, they desperately needed that level of play for, for Matthew Delavidova. And without that level of play, I don't think they advanced to the grand final series. Well, we're going to talk more about Melbourne and Tasmania a little bit later in the show. This series is going to feature two top offences that ranked in the top three teams for assists in the regular season. But will they feature in the assists of the month presented by Amy? Now, let's take a look. Here comes Cox. All the way in to first to second. Here's Hickey down the line. But Illy gets to his spot. He's one of the best in the world at throwing it up. Delhi continuing to make plays. is The Jump presented by Hungry Jacks. And if you're not up to speed with the talents of Tyrese Proctor, you should catch up now. A second year guard with college powerhouse Duke, Proctor enters March Madness with a big decision looming. Return to school or declare for the NBA draft. Last weekend, I traveled to North Carolina to check out how the 19 year old is handling the expectations. Yeah, I mean, it obviously hasn't gone perfect. Uh, hasn't gone you know, exactly how, how I'd like, but you know, the season's not, not over yet and, um, you know, I'm still confident in myself and, and know how good I can play. Obviously, you know, battled some injuries and stuff like that throughout the year, which set me back. But 
uh, for the most part, I've been pretty happy with how I've played and, and I'm, you know, I'm happy with where our team's at right now. You have become, you know, certainly from the outside for me, a, a leader for this team. Uh, now, obviously, in your second year. Is that something that's, that's, that's come naturally to you? Do you need to work on that? And do you see yourself as a leader of this team? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, last year, obviously, I wasn't captain or anything like that, but I felt like, you know, being a point guard for Duke, you sort of have to take that res responsibility and, and take ownership for that. Obviously, transitioning into this year, I was, you know, fortunate to be uh, named captain with Jeremy and Ryan, and, you know, that comes with a certain amount of, um, you know, expectation. But you know, from a leader point stamp, a leadership standpoint, um, being a point guard of the team, you sort of have to have it. You know, you got to be vocal, you got to be, um, you know, connected with your coach on the court at all times. And you know, I think that's just something that I sort of took on um, in the first year that I tried to, you know, improve and grow um, this year. And you know, I think it's something that I've sort of had my whole life, just playing back home um, with Sutherland and stuff like that, and you know, moving through the academy. Um, so I think it's just something I had um, and it's just, it's just come natural and obviously you know, I'm working on it every day um, to, to become a better leader. Um, everyone from the outside like me uh, talks about the NBA draft. What goes into that decision then? Last year I know you discussed with, with, with all the people that, that are important to you can help you through that. Um, what's it going to be this year after you've had an early year of understanding what you get, where your game is at and what it's like at the college level? Yeah, I mean just what, whatever feels comfortable, um, whether that's gone, coming back, you know, like I said, the season's not over yet and um, I'm obviously going to have my conversations with the right people and the people I need to and, um, you know, whatever happens next, happens next. You've got to love the honesty from Tyrese Proctor there. He admitted himself that perhaps it hasn't been the season, a perfect season for him by any stretch. Andrew Gay's back here with us. Uh, what have you seen from Tyrese Proctor this year? Because there's no question he's got a very big role on this team that now is going to try and go on a run in March Madness. No, well, first and foremost, a shout out to uh, Tyrese Proctor for not losing the Australian accent. There's some players that go over there and after 10 minutes they seem to be talking with an American accent. So I like the fact that he's been able to main, maintain some of the Aussie twang, so to speak. But uh, I like the composure this guy brings to, to the floor. His shooting percentages this season in his, uh, in his sophomore season have gone up compared to last season. So the trajectory looks really good. You can see by the way in which that he, he moves, the, the, the basketball IQs there, the shooting stroke is as sweet as you'll ever want to be. And I think some think that perhaps he hasn't progressed as quickly as what they thought. When he went to Duke, there was speculation that this kid's a one-and-done guy and he's going to be a, a lottery pick. Uh, he, he's clearly not that just yet and, and wasn't that, but he's in improving where he has, is, is on that trajectory where he should be a, a, an NBA player, uh, averaging about 10 points a game, playing in a high-pressure environment, which you saw firsthand, Kane, uh, for Duke. It, it, that is a, a, a good development program to get into the NBA, and uh, I would be encouraging, based on what I've seen this year and what I think they're going to be inheriting or the, some of the players coming in, that maybe another year in college basketball will help in that development. Yeah, it's interesting. A lot of people around the school, you mentioned uh, we were down there, and they were saying, look, we want Tyrese to go to the NBA, but also we know that he is so reliable for us that if he wants to come back next year and, and play that, that point guard role again, they would be very happy with that. Uh, some of the chat was that he hasn't been aggressive enough as a scorer and maybe there's room for him to take more shots and be more involved mm. as a scorer. Well, that, that is true. And, and I've seen that. And, and particularly when you're, you're trying to um, put your best foot forward as getting the attention of a lot of the, the, the NBA scouts. And we just spoke about uh, padding your numbers, mm. but I, I think that he, he has earned the right to be a little bit more aggressive on the offensive end. He's playing alongside Jared McKay who uh, most people have in that top 15 in, in next year's draft. And I think when you're there, it, it shows that he, he's not out there for himself. He's playing very much within the, the, the team system. Uh, he's prepared to share the ball around. And uh, I personally don't think that, that hurts him. But as far as the narrative around uh, the, the chatter that goes on, as far as a player's prospect, some of the, the, the numbers would be assisted if, uh, if those numbers are a little higher.
And if he does have a big march, uh, maybe the NBA does call. But uh, tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. on ESPN2, Duke in the ACC tournament. Not sure who they're playing yet as a two seed in that tournament. And if you're not into that, you can watch uh, me and Scooby and Aaron on Nothing But Net on uh, the ESPN <laughs> channel there, followed by an NBA doubleheader. Uh, George Raymore joining us on that show as well. But just settle yourself in at home. Because after a one-week hiatus, truth or trash returns. Luke Travers to Paris, NBL playing time, SGA stat padding, it's all on the agenda. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Jump, presented by Hungry Jacks. And it's time now for a little bit of truth or trash. And there might be a bit of NBL grand final flavor to this. Andrew Gaze is back with me, of course. And I'm going to ask him the first truth or trash. Now, we know, Gazy, that Alex Sari is going to get drafted higher than Ariel Hook 40, but after watching both of these series, my question to you, truth or trash, Ariel Hook 40 is more NBA ready than Alex Sarr? Ooh. Well, I'm going to tentatively put that in the uh, trash category because I think Alex Sarr, what we've seen, the way in which he can protect the rim, he can shoot the ball from the perimeter, his ball handling skills in transition have been exceptional. And then you see there the way in which he can rip it and get to, to the rim, I think is what has uh, many NBA teams salivating around about his prospects. He's uh, not afraid to get down and dirty, dive on the loose balls, plays with great uh, energy. And that, <laughs> that length, you just can't uh, teach a lot of that. So I think uh, Alex Sarr is ready. But having said that, I also think uh, Hook Porty has got that NBA body. Perhaps his body is a little bit more mature than Saar, but uh, both of those guys, I think, have uh, NBA characteristics. And, of course, with Saar being likely in some mock drafts, having him as the number one pick, you see the breakdown there. Not a whole lot of difference between the two. Uh, uh, Saar averaging around... Uh, 17 minutes a game, Hook Porty 18 minutes a game. They both do it very efficiently. Uh, the rebounding is the stick out, is, is the standout point for Hook Porty. But Star is uh, is uh, going to be fun to watch his development in the NBA. I like it. What do you got? Hey, uh, now now Kane, truth or trash? Yeah. We know that unfortunately, and it breaks our heart that Ben Simmons has. Uh, Got a flare-up of his back issues. He's been ruled out for the remainder of the NBA season. And I think on that basis, we all assume, although they haven't officially put the texter through his name just yet, but he has been... You would think that it's unlikely he's going to be playing in Paris for the Boomers. Truth or trash, Luke Travers would be a great uh, replacement or guy that could play a Ben Simmons type role with the Boomers. So it was interesting, Gazy. You said earlier on this show that you thought Matthew Dellavedova was the MVP of that series against Illawarra. If it wasn't going to be Dally, I think it might have been Luke Travers. He had a massive three games, and I think there's a little bit of yes. truth to this. Now, the issue that the Boomers will have, or certainly Brian Gorgian and the selection staff is going to have, is that Luke Travers, Xavier Cooks, Jack White, in many respects, play similar roles. And I don't think any of them have got to the level of Ben Simmons at his absolute best. But without question, I think what we've seen this year from Luke Travers in Melbourne, I think that he's played himself into the squad, absolutely, to give himself a chance to go to Paris. What do you say? I think that that's a very good a judgment that you're making. He's right on the bubble. The problem that they have is when you've got Josh Giddy and the expectation is Josh is going to be handed the keys to the Boomers, uh, he's not a great perimeter shooter. It is improving, by the way. And Travers falls into that category as well. I love the versatility of Travers. I think one day we will see him in a green and gold jersey. Not quite sure with the makeup of this year's team he's going to get the, get the uh, ticket to Paris. No, very fair. But at least he attempts some outside shots, Gazy. All right, I'm coming back to you. And I'm going to ask the question. Now, being <laughs> over here now, I don't get to be in the NBL arenas. But one of the things that I love is I get to sit back and listen to the outstanding broadcast. You're a part of that. One of the trends that I noticed over the last few days was... Thank you. These players are fatigued. There's a short turnaround to the next game. Uh, are they starting to wear down later in the series? And I'm thinking to myself, they're playing 32, 33 minutes. Gazy, when you played, you played 47. And even then, you were angry that you didn't play 48. So truth or trash, Thank you. if you don't want these players to fatigue in the postseason, <laughs> then play them a few more minutes in the regular season. <laughs> 
Oh, I'm with you, Kane. I don't buy into the fact that uh, that 32 minutes is doing uh, over-the-top heavy lifting. And, and I guess it's because that these teams, there's so much talent on uh, the rosters that they've got to find minutes for the players throughout the course of the, the regular season. But uh, I don't know whether playing more minutes in the regular season is actually going to help you. You look at Bryce Cotton, he was a warrior throughout the course of the regular season uh, and didn't come out of games unless it was an exceptional set of circumstances. Uh, But I don't know whether playing more minutes in the regular season would actually help them in regards to that. But in in regards to preparing them for for the playoffs, but there's no doubt in playoff basketball, you do have to shorten your rotation. Yes, uh, Damon Lowry would be complaining, sitting on the couch. I know that. He's always complaining about the minutes. All right, I'm coming back to you. So uh, we want to have an NBA flavour with this. And uh, people talk a lot about stat padding. We saw Shea Gilgis Alexander yesterday in the game against the Indiana Pacers. Uh, Just foul. And the game is pretty much out of reach at this point. Double digits, clock running down. Intentional foul sends the Pacers player to the free throw line and then races down the floor and just gets another little bucket here with the game over. So truth Mm. or trash, Shea Gildress Alexander, simple stat padding and it has gone too far. (laughs) Well, there has been some crazy examples of uh, stat padding throughout the course of the season, particularly on those uh, milestone Uh, situations when a a player needs to get a triple-double, they're one rebound short and they go and put them into the game to try and uh, get a rebound, which is really a a token rebound. This here is one where I guess you're saying, well, we want to see players play out the game and we want to see them uh, play right through to the final buzzer. And maybe that's what he was trying to do, albeit that this one was, was in the book. Uh, I don't like it. Uh, I think that there's a, across an 82 game regular season, there's plenty of time to get your numbers up. Uh, and but uh, I, I can appreciate why with some of these players where they have incentives in their contracts for a certain number uh, of performances that that maybe that might be a motivating factor. But it does have a bit of a look at me, bit sort of. Uh, a selfish type of approach to it. Not that I'm saying Shea Gilgis Alexander is selfish in any way, shape or form. Yes, and we did just see the graphic there. So he passed Kevin Durant for the most 30-point individual games within a regular season. Durant had 47 a couple of times. Uh, now Shea Gilgis Alexander with 48. But uh, I don't mind the stat padding too much, but I absolutely don't have a problem with the top NBL players of the week. We've got them next. Along with a grand final series preview, who you got, United or the Jack Jumpers? We'll be back in a minute. You're watching the jump presented by Hungry Jacks in just over three hours' time. Game two of the WNBL grand final series gets underway from Perth. Uh, Lauren Jackson and the Southside Flyers looking to stave off elimination after being handled by 22 points in Game 1. The Lynx can clinch their first title since 1992 with a win. Of course, uh, you're going to be able to catch that game on ESPN. We're about to shift gears to NBL Grand Final mode, but before we do that, let's take one last look back at the semis. Drama field and, let's be honest, a little bit chippy, which we absolutely love. Uh, We also love our top plays of the week, presented by Hungry Jacks. The time has come. Great, Great pass. Golding with the block. Huge. Horty comes over to help. And Chris Golding in the flow there. You just good, but I'm so great. Do whatever it takes. All I do is slack. You heard the hug. Look at how it look. The outfit raw got me looking uncooked. Schedule not flexible, period. And there's Hook Horty with the jam. Delhi continuing to make plays. Oh, status. I ain't new to this. Fire. Speaking of which, Ariel Aborty says, allow me to introduce myself. You just good, but I'm so great. Do whatever it takes. All I do is... Andrew Gaze, Derek Rucker, just some superb calls to match some superb plays. And I already can't wait for Sunday afternoon now at JCA. The Thank Jack you. Jumpers and Melbourne United. <laughs> uh, the Jack Jumpers have been road warriors through the season. They were actually eight and six in the regular season. So they're not going to be afraid of going to JCA. They won two out of the three matchups. We've only got one game before we catch up again next week on the jump. What are you expecting from this game one and what are some of the things that you're looking at? 
Well, I think that Melbourne United will go into it as a favourite, albeit that they lost the series throughout the, the, the regular season. But the defensive uh, intensity that uh, Melbourne United can apply, I think, is going to be a factor. Uh, I think that the Jack Jumpers are well equipped, but on a home deck in that game one, yeah, I, I'm expecting Melbourne United to come out after a very tough series against uh, Illawarra. They are playoff hardened because of that series. Uh, but this is going to be an, an intriguing one. The, the Tassie, they are very efficient on the offensive end. They, they control the tempo. And they also, have, when you think of uh, Will Magne and Marcus Lee, they've got two big boys to go up against the two big boys from Melbourne United. So if they uh, neutralise each other, it, it can come down to, well, what sort of work can you do from the perimeter? And the way Jack McVeigh's been playing, I think Jordan Crawford's got a, a little bit more to give. So the, the uh, Jack Jumpers have got a lot that they're going to uh, test Melbourne United with. Uh, but in, in this opening game, I think the edge goes uh, to Melbourne United. All right, so a question without notice. Milton Doyle, we've seen him go crazy in yesterday's game and in game two of that series uh, against Perth. Uh, who does Luke Travis guard as the primary matchup? Milton Doyle, a little bit of a smaller a guard type or Jack McVeigh? Different players. It, it, it's true. You'd love to have him on both. But uh, <laughs> I think Milton Doyle is the, the engine room on the offensive end for the, uh, the Jack Jumpers. Jack McVeigh does it in a variety of different ways. And, and I think throughout the course of the series, they'll have a look at a, a variety of different options and see what comes out the best. But uh, Luke Travers, with his size and his athleticism, the way in which that he can push um, Milton Doyle into to, to tougher positions, I think that's why, the way they'll start. But... But who knows? Jack McVeigh's been great. It's going to be an interesting start to this series. As we said, game one on Sunday on ESPN. Andrew Gaze, thank you very much. As always, uh, we can't wait for this series. The Jack Jumpers and United, it gets started on Sunday afternoon on ESPN.